I'm going on an adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. California ground squirrel. It's one of the types of ground squirrels that are quite common in the United States. This type is found west of the Rockies. I said scrolls, not squirrels. This is a show about archaeology, not zoology. The Dead Sea, not the Red Sea. Dead Sea Scrolls. Ancient writings on goatskin. Who wrote them? In 1947, a little Bedouin boy, a shepherd, took his sheep out for a little walkabout in the desert to find some something to eat for the sheep. One of the sheep ran away from the flock and into a cave. The Bedouin boy wasn't in the mood of chasing the sheep inside the cave, so he picked up a stone and threw it into the cave. Suddenly, he heard a crack. A pot broke. Not his mother's pot, but an ancient pot. And from it spilled scroll after scroll of ancient writings, arguably the greatest archaeological discovery ever made. 1,000 religious texts from the time of Jesus, Ben-Hur, Spartacus, significant to Jews and Christians alike. Scholars saw the writings as a window onto the early years of Christianity. The first archaeologist said the scrolls were written by an ancient and mysterious Jewish sect called the Essenes, who lived in a settlement near the Dead Sea known as Qumran. But some modern archaeologists say Essenes didn't live at Qumran. So what can archaeology tell us about who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? I'm heading to the Shrine of the Book, the museum built to house this treasure of holy fragments. This is the very Bible Jesus might have read. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 1,000 years older than any Bible known to man. I met curator Adolfo Reutemann and asked him, What's so special about this ancient hide? So, wh wh what are the Dead Sea Scrolls all about? The fact that we have on display material written 2,000 years ago, in some cases hundreds of years before Jesus was born, hmm, is actually a real miracle in archaeology. It's a miracle. It's a miracle because for the first time we have original material written 2,000 years ago. People, through these documents, they come in touch with real people, not virtual people. And these people, they left messages that in many cases they're relevant also for us as modern human beings. So what were the messages and who wrote them? Many of the texts were biblical, but some were strange documents that archaeologists dubbed the War Scroll and the Damascus Document. These documents reveal that the Essenes followed a messiah-like figure they called the Teacher of Righteousness, that they thought they were living the end of days, a time involving a monumental battle between bad and good, with the Essenes definitely on the good side. Here's what the texts say. The sons of light will attack the sons of darkness. There shall be a battle and horrible carnage before the God of Israel and eternal annihilation for the forces of darkness. Then there shall be a time of salvation for the people of God. Strangely, these texts came into the hands of Professor Sukenik of the Hebrew University two years after the annihilation of Nazi Germany and on the very date of the birth of the modern state of Israel. Now, try to figure out what this guy, he thought, when actually he has in hand manuscript produced by Jews, and as he argued, hidden in caves on the eve of the destruction of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and they came back to the Jewish nation on the eve of the rebirth of the modern state of Israel. So you can understand it saying, okay, just, it happened just by chance. You can say, you know, this is part of the, uh, of the mystery of the Jewish nation. Hmm? You can see it's not just a coincidence. Maybe it's plan of the divine plan. 
I have no answer, but it's a fact that people, they felt that there is a, a, a mysterious coincidence hmm, that you have original material produced by real Jews hmm, when exactly the same day when uh, it was established the birth of the modern state of Israel. Pretty strange. I had to go to Qumran where the scrolls were found to see for myself. South of Jerusalem, 17 kilometers past En Gedi, across from the Dead Sea, is Qumran. This is Qumran. This is supposedly where the Essenes lived. According to the ancient writers like Josephus, Pliny, and Philo, the Essenes lived along the coast of the Dead Sea. That sea is right over there. And archaeology discovered this seemingly monastic settlement. Some people say that's, that was their scriptorium right there. That means where people sit around copying holy texts. How do they know they copied things? Holy texts? Because they found the remains of a very long table, maybe it was a dining room, but there were inkwells there. So it seems to suggest that either they were writing up menus every day or they were actually copying holy texts. They were ascetic. They weren't into material things. They believed in purity, both physical and spiritual. There were mikvahs here, baths for ritual purity, for baptism in essence. I'm lying in an aqueduct to illustrate where the water went through, and it went all the way here to more cisterns. This was meant to supply water to a lot of people. Look at this huge, huge cistern. This was no little farm. Just a three-minute walk from this settlement are the 11 caves in which they found the scrolls. Altogether, these ruins, the water systems, and the caves proved to the first archaeologists that Essenes lived here. Some modern archaeologists now claim no Essenes lived at Qumran. So who do they think wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Make sure, hold on to my ankle so I don't fall down that precipice. Well, are you holding on to my ankle? <laughs> That's cave number four where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. The greatest find of the 20, 20th, maybe 21st century, the Dead Sea Scrolls, thousands of scrolls, thousands and thousands of fragments right there in that cave. Well, while talking to myself and the camera, I was approached by Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologist Yuval Pelik. I wasn't in trouble, he was my date. That's cave number four, right? That's five. That's four five. Is... It looks just like four. <laughs> yeah. No, I that's always true. get the mixed that's up. True, that's true. The original Bedouin kid went in there? No, cave number one, the cliffs. So I got the wrong cave. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely the wrong cave. I almost fell down head first <laughs> down that gully for the wrong cave. Yeah. According to Yuval Peleg, this was not the only thing I got wrong. He says this site was not an Essene outpost, but a pottery factory, and showed me the kilns to back his theory. He explained that the cisterns and the aqueducts were for cleaning the clay, not for purifying the Essenes. So, how does he explain the scrolls? According to Peleg, refugees running from the Romans hid them in these hills. So who wrote them? Everybody wrote them. We know that not a special writer wrote all the 700 or something. Or a special group. No. These, all these scrolls were brought by the refugees that ran away from the Roman army. So you're saying those scrolls are really a library and they were... This is the library of Judaism, not just the Essenes who lived in Qumran. According to Peleg, what they found here was the library of all Judaism, not just the Essenes. He then led me to cave number four to show me the final proof for his theory that this was a pottery factory, not an Essene commune. Since the caves were full of scroll fragments, archaeologists had assumed that the Essenes were burying damaged holy texts here. Not so, says Peleg. The damage was caused by animals tearing apart texts hidden by refugees in an abandoned pottery factory. When archaeologists came here, they found Which fragments. Cool, yeah. I think it's animals. You can see that there are lots of holes and... There are animals that would have been right there, right? That's animal poop? Yeah. What kind of animal poop? It's like small, a... it's like mouse. Like I mean. a desert rat? Yeah, desert rat, something like that. The rat is a rodent, like the squirrel. But we want to talk about the scrolls, not squirrels. Peleg says that the inkwells they found weren't for writing scrolls, but for labeling the pots. 
He claims the factory workers dug out these caves to get the quartz to mix with the clay to make the pots stronger. So, this cave wasn't a repository for holy books, but a quarry for pottery. When we took some of the clay and mixed it with this quartz, we made new vessels, pottery vessels. So you think they were digging out for quartz? For they these created, layers. You can see they layers created and these layers. caves? These are man-made caves, yeah, you say? Man-made caves. That's the last stage of our theory. We have the kilns, we have that, we have that. Huh? We have a reason for the caves. You have a system with the aqueducts of purifying water for, for the clay. For the clay. Yeah. You've got man-made caves for the quartz. For the quartz. You made the pots. You, you have kilns. It's all making sense as a pottery factory, pottery industry. There's no connection between the scrolls and the site. I was troubled by Peleg's theory. First century historian Josephus says that there were Essenes by the Dead Sea. Peleg says it was a pottery factory. Most archaeologists say that the scrolls in the caves were connected to the archaeological site known as Qumran. Pelek says that the scrolls have nothing to do with the pottery factory that was found there. So I went back to Jerusalem to discuss Pelek's theory with Professor Gabi Barkai. I started by making Pelek's argument. Just because a bunch of people say there were these Essenes on the Dead Sea and you find scrolls near the Dead Sea, yeah. doesn't mean they're the same people. It the is. scrolls could have been brought there by people fleeing, burning Jerusalem, hidden in a cave, and this has nothing to do with the Essenes. We have uh, two elements at Qumran. We have the caves and you have the ruin. If you separate between those two, and then you can get all t to all kinds of interpretations. Maybe aliens all, from outer space wrote them. You can make it into a military fort. You can make it into a rich farmer's uh, farmstead. Uh, you can make it into a hamlet. Uh, hamlet? Alas, poor York. But what does the archaeology tell you? You say listen, they're connected. Listen, they are connected logically. They are connected archaeologically. They are connected. The facts are there, and Do I you? think it makes sense. The facts are that in 68 AD, Rome came and destroyed Qumran. Two years later, in 70 AD, Rome destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. So, are the scrolls the long lost wisdom of the Qumran Essenes, or the long lost Jerusalem library spirited out by refugees? Maybe the answer to this riddle involves not the texts that were found, but the texts that were missing. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been called the greatest archaeological find of all time. And yet, archaeologists can't agree who wrote them. Maybe the clue to the authors is not in the scrolls that were found, but in the texts that are missing. The temple in Jerusalem was the center of Jewish life. Whoever controlled it was in power. In the second century BC, the Maccabee brothers took control of the temple, thus causing a split in Judaism. There were those who saw the Maccabees as political heroes, and others, like the Essenes, who felt the Maccabees had polluted the temple, forcing true believers into a desert exile. So who left the scrolls at Qumran? If they were brought by refugees fleeing Jerusalem, the scrolls would preserve fragments celebrating the Maccabees. Essenes, on the other hand, would never include the hated Book of Maccabees in their library. I met with Professor Eileen Schuller of McMaster University. There's a lot of controversy about who wrote the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. It seemed that at one point everybody said it was the Essenes. Now, some we, we were in Qumran, and there's a theory now that basically what we're looking at is not the repository of a community, but rather the scrolls of refugees from uh, the destruction in Jerusalem. It's a bit odd to say, well, we have all these texts, but they have nothing to do with the people that are living here. And there's material that's not here. I mean, if we looked at what would you expect to find in the libraries of Jerusalem, you, you know, might expect to have a copy of the book of First Maccabees, whereas you don't have that at Qumran. You tend to have texts that are very critical of the temple and of the priesthood, whether things are being done correctly or not, and they basically don't think they are. So it seems that the Dead Sea Scrolls are not the long-lost Jerusalem library. 
their authors ignored the Maccabees and predicted an apocalypse. But they were also an ascetic community, into detailed rules meant to sanctify everyday life. No one should sleep with a woman in the holy city so as not to defile it with impurity. On the Sabbath, do not say a useless or stupid word. On the Sabbath, you may not go beyond 1,000 cubits from the city. Your latrines must be 2,000 cubits from the city and out of sight of the camp, so as not to pollute the camp. These rules say Essenes to me, but we need evidence on the ground to prove it. I decided to speak with someone who both reads the scrolls and also dug at Qumran, archaeologist James Tabor. You excavated at Qumran, didn't you? Yeah, yeah I've dug there. You yeah. dug there. What do you make of Qumran? Who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Who two. wrote them Dead Sea they're, Scrolls? They're, now, let me tell you something that's brewing right now that might shut up everything, but I, I'll tantalize you. I get tantalized by archaeology. Oh, you're going to get real tantalized by this. Here's the bluff. James Tabor found a clue squirreled away in the Damascus document that proves the Essenes were at Qumran. This clue was where no one would think to look, the Essene latrine. I see it, I see it, hallelujah, I see it. <laughs> Professor Tabor's hunt for the latrines begins with Josephus. This first century historian writes that he admired the will of the Essenes because, contrary to tradition, they didn't feast the night of the Sabbath. James wondered why Essenes wouldn't feast. So, he went to the scrolls. On the Sabbath, you may not go beyond 1,000 cubits from the city. Your latrines must be 2,000 cubits from the city and out of sight of the camp, so as not to pollute the camp. So on the Sabbath, Sabbath you got a problem, because you can't go out, and yet, what if you have to go to the bathroom? But you're supposed to feast on Friday night. You're saying the scroll community had a had theological to... problem. They had one commandment that said, don't go a outside distance. the perimeter, outside your yeah. house. Another yeah. commandment, don't put the toilet in the In one text, it's 1,000, and one, it's okay, 2,000. So, so they got a problem. They got a problem. Josephus mentions this problem. It's a problem. And in admiration. In admiration that they're dealing with it by not eating much on Friday night. Yeah. You're saying, wait a minute. If, if, if it's the same people Josephus is talking about, and we should be able to find their toilets. And the scrolls are talking about. We should be able to find their toilets. So what do you do? It's this kind of archaeology that I admire. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, but there's a clue. It says in the war scroll they're northwest of the camp. Oh, well, it's like they put them strategically where the wind, wind wasn't blowing? I don't know why. Blow, wind says, is blowing it away. It says northwest. Oh. They don't want to be downwind from the toilet. I, I, stood at, I love this. I stood at the pool. This is real archaeology. I stood at the pool on the northwest corner, and I shot a laser beam, 2,000 cubits due northwest. I get about, I'd say, 1,500 cubits. And you, terrible smell. I start, look, no. I start looking around. And all of a sudden on the ground. No way. What do I see? I see stones set in an exact uh, rectangular. It's a two staller. Really? The doorway is away from the camp, and then it's got, you know, like this. It's like a U. So are you going to call me the toilet hunter instead of the scroll hunter? The outhouse hunter. I hate my life. I was back at Qumran to find Essene latrines. Is it possible that some ancient plumbing will answer the question who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? I called Professor Tabor, chair of the Department of Religious Studies in North Carolina, Charlotte, to talk me through the directions. One sec, I want to go, I should walk that way? Okay, I'm starting to walk. I'm starting to walk towards the rock cliff. I'm walking. It's a ways. That's, that's the point, right? Who would have thought that the secrets of the Dead Sea Scrolls would have been solved by a latrine. Okay, but just tell me this, on the left side of the outcropping, I'll see a bath, and then what will I see? A path, and then what will I see? It'll lead to what? Okay, I'll call you back, goodbye. Come on, guys. Naked archeology span can figure out ancient mysteries with ancient poop, it's true. Do you see a path? Is that a path? I think we took a shortcut. I think that's the path. Whew. I'm out of breath. 
totally out of breath. I'll tell you one thing, I couldn't have been an Essene. Couldn't have held it in so long. I see it, I see it, hallelujah, I see it. This is the communal house, right here. It says Northwest, this is Northwest. And hey, right there, there's a natural outcropping which would hide you from the camp. You can't see the camp, the camp can't see you. So this is kind of the ancient version of a stall. I see it, it's actually separated. I'll walk there. See, I'm walking right between the two rectangles. There's even an entranceway right here. I'm seeing an arrangement. Look, you come right in here. Oops, sorry, not looking. You walk right in here, see? Using the scrolls, we found the plumbing which proves this was no pottery factory, but the home of the Essenes. And these guys saw their every action, from war to prayer to bodily functions, worthy of a rule to make it holy. There you have it, proof that the Essenes wrote the scrolls. Here they waited for the end of history, following their leader, the teacher of righteousness. Some scholars believe this teacher was the prototype of the Christ figure, Dr. Stephen Fawn, scroll scholar. Now, w while we still have sun, let me ask you, um, one of the scrolls, the famous scrolls, uh, there's famous scrolls in these things, and they talk about the teacher of righteousness, which seems to be a Jesus-like figure. Who is it? I think the teacher of righteousness was, as many other scholars, that he was a high priest. He was pushed out from the priesthood in Jerusalem, and he was tortured terribly in the dungeons. In his hymns that we find, which is known as the Thanksgiving hymns, he speaks of the fact that he no longer even cared about the cries of the people around him, but nevertheless, God was faithful and that the Holy Spirit came to him, and that his heart was changed and how he had, had changed from being a man of flesh and blood to becoming a child of light. And how through this overwhelming it sounds, it sounds, process. Uh, it sounds uh, pretty Christian. Do you think these are proto-Christians? out of this kind of movement, the Christians? You know, we have, we have some Jewish guides come out saying, you know, these texts are Christian texts. They sound so Christian to us because of these things that they say. And Christians read the text and say, no, they sound Jewish. Fact is, yes, this is the both worlds together before those worlds split. Modern Judaism grew from rabbinic teachings which, like the Essene scrolls, celebrate a divine law that seeks to sanctify every action. Christianity, on the other hand, is built on an utter devotion to an Essene-like messianic figure. The Dead Sea Scrolls have served to fill in the gaps made by time and men and to show us what doesn't change. <laughs>